Good morning. Welcome you all to worship and pray. Uh, ask you now to join us for a time of quiet prayer and meditation as we prepare our hearts to worship God. Welcome everyone who is with us. Good to be in the house of the Lord. Very important announcement. We will not be here next week. Von Clarken is next weekend. We will have no services. If you show up, the door will be locked. So please, if you're not going with us, go to Shiloh or go to Oak Ridge or Unity or your home church or wherever you would like to go. But I don't want anybody to show up here and thinking we're going to be here. So please, that's a big announcement. Um, and we will be repeating that all week long. Um, reminder that the youth are coming back today. Um, they should be back around 1 o'clock, so if you're waiting for children, they should text you, and they should be about right, back right after lunchtime. Um, today is uh, Missions Sunday, in which we take up a missions offering. Uh, we do that the last Sunday of every month, so please make a note of that. Please make a note that we're using the Nicene Creed this morning in worship, which we also do on the last Sunday of the month. Um, please make a note of the, the items in the bulletin. We have several that are there. We also um, want to remember several who are going through difficult times. We've had a, several deaths in the ch life of the church over the last month. Um, Matt Hall, who's one of our newer members, his granddad passed away. and The funeral will be tomorrow. And then uh, Renee Carter. We do want to pray for them tomorrow as they go through the funerals and also those who've lost loved ones just for grace and peace. We do have a happy announcement that we have a, a marriage in the church. Uh, Mr. Tom Morgan has gotten married and his lovely bride is with him, Miss Martha, who is not unfamiliar to us. So we want to w wish you a uh, congratulations and we want to pray for you and your marriage. So, but it's good to have you all here today. Let's prepare our hearts now to worship the Lord.
Let's stand for the call to worship. The call to worship this morning comes from Psalm 98, verse 1. O oh, sing to the Lord a new song, for he has done marvelous things. His right hand and his holy arm have worked salvation for him. Let's turn in our red trinity hymnals to number 119. As we sing, I sing the almighty power of God, 119 in the red trinity hymnal. Let us pray. Father in heaven, we come and we are thankful that you are a God who is always present because you are everywhere. By your spirit and your presence, you are everywhere. And we are thankful that we can never be separated from you because of your power and your grace and your mercy through Jesus Christ. Father, we come. And we confess that we deserve eternal separation. But through Christ, you have given us a forgiveness of our sins. We confess our sins. And we confess that we only have hope in Jesus Christ. Father, bless us as we come to worship. May we worship in spirit and truth. May we worship in the power of Christ. And Father, we use the words of Christ as he taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. A words of assurance from Scripture comes from Romans 8.1. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. If you have confessed your sins before God, trusting by faith in the person and work of Jesus, then the Scriptures say, there is now no condemnation. Your sins are forgiven in Christ. We come now and confess our faith we, on the fourth Sunday, we use the Nicene Creed. These creeds, the Nicene Creed especially, was given to help us combat heresy, especially things about Christ. So as we say this this morning,
Pay attention especially to what it's saying about Jesus, what it's saying about Christ, and what we believe concerning our Lord and Savior. With that in mind, Christians, what do you believe? We believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, for, who for us and our, for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary, and was made man, and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried, and the third day he rose again according to the scriptures, and ascended into heaven, and is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he shall come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead, whose kingdom shall have no end. And we believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets, and we believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church, we acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and we look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Father, take our tithes and offerings and use them for your glory, the building of your church, for the good of the lost, for the good of this world. Bless them, and we pray it in Christ's name. Amen. You may be seated. Seated. If you would take your blue ARP Psalter, we're going to sing selection number 69, or Psalm 69, selection D. The name of God, we are changing the tune, however. The words are correct, but we are going to use the tune to um, a, oh, for a thousand tongues to sing, I believe. And, and that's just a simpler tune. We're going to try that. So we're going to sing all five verses, so be aware.
Let us pray. Gracious Father, we come and we are thankful for the many good things that you are bringing to us in our life, the life of our congregation, the life of our community, nation, and world. Father, it is so easy for us to often focus on the negatives, the things that upset us and hurt us, the things that bother us, the things that aren't going exactly like we want. But Father, help us to have a heart that seeks out and looks. Help us to have open eyes to see the great blessings that you have given to each of us, even in the midst of difficulties. We come and have joy just for Christ, but upon, above Christ, we even have more. And we are a thankful people. Father, we come and we are thankful for a large group of young people going to Monk Larkin. We're thankful for the gospel being preached to them. We're thankful for the influence that we can have on a group of people that we haven't had influence on before. And we pray that you might work as we see this world tearing itself apart over issues of race, over issues of, socio of socioeconomic issues. Father, we pray that we might be a gospel answer at least in part, to the troubles of this world. Father, use us as you will, and we thank you for the opportunity that you've put before us. Father, we come, and we are thankful for this church, for what it means to each of us, the family of God, the people who are here, and bind us together, draw us together, and build us up in Christ to be a true living temple in which your spirit and presence dwells. Father, we come and we thank you for your uh, constant grace that you give us in Christ. Father, we come and we pray for our government. We pray for our city council and our county council as there are many things that they face, uh, both of economics, of staffing, of services, financial. Father, there's many things that they have to juggle, and I just pray you would give them wisdom and give them the resources to meet the needs of our community. We pray for the lost. We pray that we would, as a church, help us to love the lost. Not just people who look like us who are lost, but anyone who does not know the Lord Jesus Christ. Help us to have compassion and help us to reach out to them. Father, help us to use the 10 list that you've given us as a program to organize our outreach. Help us with side door opportunities like Wednesday night. Help us with other opportunities like Mark 924 that we might bring people in. You might lead people to us through those side door opportunities. Father, we pray for the ministry of the church as people are here. We pray for our worship. We pray your blessing upon our worship. We pray, upon, we pray for our Christian education in all levels of our Christian education, that you would bless us as we learn more and more about your word and about Christ. Bless our choir. Bless Trail Life as it meets tomorrow. Continue to bless our youth breakfast and help us to uh, have an impact, not just, help us not just to be feeding people breakfast, but we pray for spiritual impact in the lives of young people. Father, we pray for the holiness of the saints. We pray that we as a church would hate our sin, that we would love righteousness. Help us to love God's word. Help us to live by God's statutes. Father, we come and we pray for the afflicted. We pray for those who are battling health concerns, who are sick. We pray for those who are injured, those who have diseases. We pray for those who are hard-pressed in life, who are going through grief, going through other emotional issues. Father, we pray, even if it's just mental stress, we pray that you would relieve them and give them grace and peace and hope and joy in Christ. Father, we come and we pray for those who just got married. We pray for those who have been married for a short time and those who have been married for a long time. And we pray you would protect our marriages and build them strong in Christ. We pray for our sister churches this morning. We pray for the Hickory Grove ARP Church, a very small congregation, and we pray for their continued ministry in the little town of Hickory Grove. Bless Boyce Wilson as he leads that congregation as their supply. 
Father, we pray for the Hill City Church in downtown Rock Hill. We pray for their pastor, Daniel Wells. And we pray for their unique ministry of reaching out to those in the arts community, of those who are not normal ARPs. And we just pray that you would continue to bless that small congregation as well. Father, open our eyes. Renew our minds. Transform us by your word and help us not to be conformed to this world that we might shine brightly the gospel of Christ. For it's in his name we pray. Amen. Children, come forward for the children's sermon. The congregation, if you would turn to Romans 12. Good morning. How are y'all? you better than me. I just banged my elbow on the piano here. That kind of hurt. Um... Let me ask you a real quick question. How good do you have to be to get to heaven? 
Marging. <coughs> you what? You have to listen to God? All right, well, how good do you have to be? How good? Okay. You have to be good enough. What else? Spencer, how good do you have to be? How, girls, how, how good do you have to be? You know? Isn't that an important question? How good do you have to be? Very good? Do you know that we can't be good enough to go to heaven? Why? Because everyone sins, but that doesn't answer that you're getting there. Close, closer. Because God loves us, how do we get to heaven? Is it because we're good? Not us being good, right? It's because who was good for us? Jesus. And Jesus died to take away our sins, but he also imputes or gives to us all of his goodness. So that we have all the goodness that we need. As soon as we believe in Jesus, he gives us all the goodness that we need to go to heaven. So why be good then? Well, we're already going to go to heaven because Jesus... Why, why be good if Jesus has already given us all the goodness we need? Why? Huh? It's good to be good. That's probably... That's, that's not bad at all. We'll go with that. It's good to be good. If you love somebody, you want to do what? You want to, you want to show them your love, right? And we love God because he's done all this for us in Jesus. And he's set us free and we eyes are open that we see that being bad is really being bad it's not just sort of wink wink bad it's really bad sin's not good sin's killing us sin had us to the point that we could have been separated from God forever and because of Jesus we're now set free and now we want to get away from sin and we want to live for him and we want to please our father in heaven that's why we're good not because we're trying to get there now, the difference there is important, right? Because have you ever had to try to earn something and it's really hard and you, you're afraid you're going to mess up and lose it? And then there's all, all other things where, like, you may be helping your parents and maybe you mess up, but it's okay because your parents love you and you're going to just he keep helping. And it, It's easier, isn't it? Well, our Father in Heaven treats us like children. He loves us. And just because we mess up a little bit, He's got grace for us there. But that doesn't mean that we don't try, right? It's not that we're trying to get to heaven. Jesus gets us to heaven. We're trying to respond to who Jesus is. And we're trying to live for Jesus out of love, okay? So when we tell you to be good, we're not trying to get you to heaven. We want you to respond to Jesus and live for him, all right? Good job, guys. That's hard. That's deep this morning. Deep, deep for you little ones. Let's pray. Father in heaven, I thank you. For these little ones and I pray that they would learn even at this age it's not about how good you are Jesus you have sent Jesus to be good for us and give us all the good that we need but also help them to understand why we need to be good that we show our love to you that you came to set us free from sin and we should be free from it it's good to be good because that's how you have made it father help us to be good we pray in Jesus name amen Thank you. Before we get started, um, Daniel Bowler's grandmother, some of us have been praying for her for a while, she had a massive stroke this morning, and I just got a text message from him. I had my phone on. Forgive me, but I was wanting to hear from him, and they really are not expecting her to, to live through the day. So with that in mind, I want to take a moment and just pray for Daniel and his family. Father in heaven, we come and we are a grieving congregation. As we've had many losses and we see another family about to go through another loss. And Father, I pray for Daniel and Miranda and I pray for the children. And I pray 
for their whole family, that you would just make yourself very real, that you would comfort them with the gospel, that you would pour out your grace and peace and be with them as a family and bless them. For we pray it in Christ's name. Amen. We're looking at Romans 12 today. So we make a switch in the what we've been looking at. We've gone from the theoretical part of the book of Romans to the more practical. Let's pray before we read God's word. Father in heaven, we come before you. Thank you for your word, and we pray now that you would bless us, open our eyes and our ears. Father, I pray you would open my mouth and give me words that your people would be edified, that your people would be taught, and that you would be glorified. Illuminate us now, Father, we pray in Christ's name. Amen. Romans chapter 12, beginning with verse 1, we'll be reading 1 and 2. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. The grass withers, the flowers fade, but the word of our Lord endures forever. Amen. Well, how do you, how you respond, how you respond in life is often important, right? We've been watching football, probably a lot of us. Some of you say, I never watch football. Well, this isn't your illustration. But some of you have been watching football, and you'll see a team, they'll have a turnover, a bad turnover. And then they have to respond. How are they going to respond? Is the defense going to step up? Will the offense come back on and, and really step up, or are they going to roll over and die? We have to respond at certain times in our life. One I think is awkward is Christmas. Christmas, you go to your in-laws, and they give you a present. How do you respond, right? It's awkward. Do you go, oh, look, oh, this is awesome, great. Or do you go, thank you. Some of that's your personality. But you want, usually you're wanting to show a proper response. You usually are very thankful. And you want to show that thankful. Same with birthdays. I think this is one reason why people don't like surprises. It's because they want to have a moment to prepare themselves to respond. Instead of having that look of, oh, oh, I don't yeah, what's going on? I, oh, thank you. I, I'm, I'm sorry. You know, and, and that's an awkwardness. How we respond in life is important. I think we understand that. How are you going to respond to what Paul has written in Romans 1 through 11? Paul has written a lot. It's deep. He's written about sin. He's written about Christ. He's written about federal theology and how Christ has saved us, our adoption, our justification, our sanctification. He's even gotten into this thing that we've just looked at in 9 through 11 about the, the Jews and the Gentiles. He has gone deep and he has laid out the case and now he is coming forward and we are to respond just as his original artist is to respond to what he said. How are you going to respond to the gospel? How are you going to respond to the, this overwhelming grace and mercy of God that we have seen in the book of Romans? Well, our teaching, I think, this morning is that Christians are to respond to the grace of God in Jesus Christ by living with the whole self to God. This is not where we just tick off a box. It's not where we just sort of come to a settled little, okay, I believe in Jesus. It's just a little bit of who we are. It should be our whole life. It should consume us in a very good way, our being a Christian. It should order our day. It should run our checkbook. It should run our calendars. It should run our life. 
And I think that's what Paul is getting at here. Well, the first thing that we see, the reason, the reason for this is the mercy of God. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, the therefore, therefore refers to verses, uh, chapter 1 through 18, excuse me, chapter 1, verse 18 through 11, 36. He's got that little short introduction in Romans, and then he hits it. And there is the gospel. There is the gospel need and the gospel answer. Therefore, because of all this, what's coming? By the mercies of God, which he has laid out in verses uh, chapter 3, 31 through 11, 36. Here is God's grace and salvation laid out clearly. And here's the touch point. Salvation is not by your works. Salvation is not by your birth or your race. Salvation is only by God's grace. How will you respond, therefore, to the mercies of God? Seeing that you add nothing to your salvation. Christ has done this work completely. The Holy Spirit has opened your hearts, opened your minds, and opened your mouth so that you confess Christ, that you have faith, and by faith alone you are now saved. How are you going to respond to this message? The world doesn't get this idea. The world, to the world, the Christian life is about what you're doing. It's about points. It's about being good enough. It's real simple. And they miss it. Look at the world. Look at any time they put something on TV about the church, it becomes moralistic. It becomes about being good, about being good work. Because the world and Hollywood doesn't understand the gospel. That it's not about what you have to do to be saved, but rather it's about what God has done for you. It's not about rules to follow. This is the problem why people don't want to come to church. They're like, I'm not good enough to come to church. Do you realize that is complete contradiction of the gospel? You're never good enough to come to church. You don't have to get right to come in these doors and be a part of us. That, the example of that is it's like saying, I'm not well enough to go to the hospital. I've got to get a little better before I can go to the hospital and get cured. It's not how it happens. And the world doesn't understand that. They think it's salvation is something to be earned, and it's not. The world thinks it's about being good enough or being the right person. But grace says that you are not, but that Christ was and is. Before we move on to see how we are to respond, make sure you understand what you're responding to. This is not a call to do more and be better so that God might love you. This therefore is connected to this idea of the, by the mercies of God. By grace. And if you don't have that, stop. Don't listen to anything else I'm saying. Go back. To Romans 1 and start over. Because this therefore has to be rooted in the gospel and by grace and not in earning a thing. It must be response. Okay. The second thing we see here. If we're going to respond to the gospel that's been presented, we are to respond by becoming a living sacrifice. In the Old Testament, you did not bring dead animals to sacrifice. Did you realize that? You're not, you know, you're not, you're not going to find roadkill and try to pass that off as something you're bringing to God, right? No, you bring a live animal. And they're supposed to be good animals, without blemish, not lame. 
excellent things. In the New Testament, we sacrifice not animals, but we are to be alive to God, and we sacrifice our life in the sense that we sacrifice our sin and our sinfulness. We're to present our bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is our spiritual worship. We're to strive for holiness. We're to hate sin and fight sin. We strive to make our lives acceptable to God, not so that we're acceptable for salvation, but rather we want to say, look at us, Father, we're, we want to be more like you. As the children of God, the sons and daughters of God, wanting to be more like our Father, wanting to be more holy, wanting to get rid of this ugliness of sin, this, this sin that has almost killed us, the sin that is destroying us, the sin that still hurts us and destroys our relationships and causes all sorts of problems. We want to get rid of it. We want to be holy and acceptable to God. And Paul says this is our spiritual worship. This is our spiritual worship. That we are to walk with Christ. And that is we are to learn from the Word. Think about what the Word of God teaches us. The Word of God teaches us who God is. And we see Him in His splendor and His glory. We see Him in His holiness and His perfection. We see Him as something so big we can't even get our arms around Him. He is bigger than we can comprehend, but we can see Him clearly. And we understand enough about Him clearly to know His character and what He, what he needs. The Bible also shines a light right on us. So that we see our filth, we see our sin, we see our need. It breaks us. It breaks us. But then it does something else. It shows us Jesus. And it shows us the incredible tender mercies of God, the love of God, in his son, Jesus Christ, who left all glory to suffer and die and rise again so that we might be saved. And it tells us how we're to live. How we are to be the people of God. This is our spiritual worship. To experience this word. To continue to grow in the knowledge of how great our God is, of how sinful we are, but how great the mercies of God is in Jesus Christ. That we see how holy he is and how unholy we are, yet the gospel is still ever growing in our mind to see that it covers all of these things and gives us the power to be different. Not that we earn our salvation, but that we glorify God and we seek to be like our Father in heaven. We, so we see that our worship is not just raw emotion. Now, I know, I, I realize I'm talking to Presbyterians here, and generally we're not known for our raw emotion in worship. But it's more than just a theological treatise as well. It's not just a rote duty that we come on Sunday morning. It's our heart's response. Our heart's response is to be acceptable and live for Christ. Do you see the difference? One is this drudgery. One is this burden like, like Bunyan says in Pilgrim's Progress where this burden is placed on and the more you read the Bible, the more it burdens you. The more you see your sin, the more burden, the more laws it burden you. And my friends, it will crush you if you continue to try to work your way to God. And thank God it will. 
Because by being crushed, then it shows you Christ. But the other way, when we see that God has given us all that we need in Jesus Christ, that all the promises of God are fulfilled in Christ, then we see that we are saved and that we live in Christ. That we are simply the sons and daughters of the living God. We don't have to earn anything. Children do not have to earn a parent's love, a parent's acceptance, a parent's grace. Neither do we as the children of God. I might add on the other side of this, though, we are not God's spoiled little brats either. We are not to live in grace as if it doesn't matter how we are to live. If you are saved, you hate sin because you see what you are saved from and you desire to follow God. You desire to be more like Him. You desire the Word. You desire to be holy and acceptable. How do you approach this? How do you approach the Bible? Do you see it as something that you need to navigate around lest it changes your life? Are you afraid of the Word of God? Are you afraid that it might cause you to have to give up something that you really don't want to give up? It should. And I would imagine it's true for the new saints as it is the older saints that we're constantly being pierced pricked, constantly being transformed by the Word of God. If we will read it, if we will listen to it, if we will let God transform us into being holy and acceptable. The third thing we see, the way this happens is by transformation and not through conformity. Paul says, do not be conformed to the world. And this is hard. The world wants to mold us the same way God wants to mold us. The world wants to mold us, and they put pressure upon us. They put social pressure, government pressure, work pressure. Our sinful self wants to be more like the world. There's a worldly knowledge and wisdom that we have to overcome. For all this is wanting to shape you and push you to be not like Christ, but be like the world. And Paul says, do not be conformed. Do not be this way. Do not take this path of easiest resistance. But rather be transformed. You are to be transformed by the renewing of your mind. How does this renewing take place? It takes place again through the Word and the Spirit. This is why you need to read your Bibles and not be scared of what God might do through reading the Word. The reason you do this is not to please me, because I'm bugging you to death to read it, right? Every time... Let's read the Bible this year. Let's read this. Let's read this. Let's, you say, well, that's Kyle's job. Yeah, it is my job. But there's more to it than just it's my job. It's not just to learn the rules that lead to salvation. It's not to secure points with God. You read the Bible so that God can transform your mind. It's great to have a guide, isn't it? If you've ever gone someplace that was completely, totally new to you, it's great to have a guide so that you can see things. Because often if you don't have a guide, you'll walk right past things that you never knew were there. One of the things we love to do when we go to Charleston is we go down to the Waterfront Park. I might have told you all this before. But Waterfront Park, and we'll sit at this particular bench and look over the water, and we'll read and watch people, and it's just really a very relaxing time except for one thing. People will come out and say, look, Fort Sumter. 
Look at the flag flying over Fort Sumter and all the birds. It's not Fort Sumter. It's Castle Pinckney. Fort Sumter's in the distance. I'm a history major. This bothers me. And about the 12th person that does it, I finally say, that's not Fort Sumter. That, no, you're wrong. You're missing it. It's good to have a guide. I remember growing up, we would go fishing down at Edisto Island on the, on the coast. And we would have these little booklets. and They were like put out by DNR. And it was a saltwater guide, and it taught us what our limits were, how long the fish had to be, how you could bait for them, what you could use, what you couldn't use, and how helpful that was to know how to do certain things like fishing or shrimping, crabbing. We need God. And God has given us a God. He's given us his word. He's given us the Bible as an infallible God. He has given us the theology of the church. He, for us, has given us Westminster, the confession and the catechisms to help us understand what the Bible says. He's given theology to the church, that the church, we don't have to just take the raw Bible and give it to everyone, every generation, but we build upon what we've wrestled through and what we've thought through. We said the Nicene Creed. We understand Christology because hundreds of years ago, men thought through this, and the church was led by it, and we build and we build. We have the Spirit working in the Word and through this theology to lead us. And all through this, our minds are being transformed so that we are not being conformed to the world, but we're being saved into something different, something spiritually alive. And Paul says the reason or the result of this transforming of the mind is that we now can discern by testing the will of God. The Bible doesn't tell us everything we need to know, right? You face something tomorrow at work. It might not have a verse that I can take you to where it says exactly the answer. But the principles the Bible lays down, you can discern the will of God through those principles. As you have been transformed, as you're being led by the Spirit, as you have this biblical knowledge, you apply that to your life rather than just being conformed into what the world would have you to do and to be. This is really packed in here, what Paul is saying. The gospel transforms us. It changes us. It makes us different than the world. Is this happening for you? Or have we kind of gotten on autopilot? Are you being transformed? Are you young people being transformed? Are you old people? And you, I'm not looking at anybody because I'm, you know, we're going to get in trouble. I'm looking down, but you old people, whoever you are, are you being transformed? Are you living for God? Or are you being conformed? If you see yourself being conformed to the world, first question you've got to go back to, do I understand grace? Am I trying to do this for my own benefit? Because if you don't have grace, and you're trying to do it the wrong way, Real easy for you to get conformed. Is it because I don't understand grace? Or is it because I'm not taking advantage of the grace that has been given to me? Of prayer, of scripture, of the church, of accountability, theology. Romans 1 through 11. Am I trying to be good based on something other than Jesus? can't do it. Where is, where are you resisting God's word? Where is there some sin in your life that you just don't want to give up? And don't tell me that it's not there. If you don't think it's there, you need to look harder. It's in my life. It's in my children's life. Y'all get an ice cream for that one. It's in your life. 
nobody, we don't get, we don't arrive in this life, do we? We are always a work. We are always leaning and depending upon Jesus Christ. And this is what Paul is saying. Go forward. But don't be conformed to this evil world. Don't be conformed to the pressures and the desires and the goals of this world. Rather be transformed. Transformed by Christ. Renewed by Christ. And living for Christ. Where... Make sure that's happening in your life. And more very specifically, where where are you fighting that transformation? Let it go and live for God. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we come today and we thank you that you have set us free from sin. You have, by your grace, you have set us so that we can be transformed and renewed by your word and spirit. And Father, help us not to resist that. Help us to embrace it. Help us to desire it. And help us to live for Christ in response to all that you have given to us. For we pray it in Christ's name. Amen. Our hymn of response this morning is number 460, Amazing Grace, 460 in your Red Trinity hymnal. The stand... just in this life. It is grace that begins our life with Christ and it takes us to that point of heaven forever where we sing 
forever of his grace. Do you have that grace? It's offered to you freely today. If you believe upon the Lord Jesus Christ as as the Son of God and the Savior of sinners, you too can know amazing grace. Now I receive the benediction of the Lord. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you, be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, amen and amen.